This week's episode is going to be a little bit more technical than usual. That's because I'm hosting Melvin Bobson, who's a physicist out of the University of Portsmouth. He specializes in information physics, and we're going to be talking about his new theory. So I wanted to record this intro and give you a little bit of the background, so you can follow along a little bit easier. Melvin essentially discovered a new law of physics that he calls the second law of infodynamics. And just like the second law of thermodynamics states that in a closed system, entropy will tend to increase or at least stay the same over time. The second law of infodynamics states that in informational systems, the information entropy will tend to decrease or stay the same over time. The theory has many implications. The first one is, if true, it means that evolution doesn't follow a random path. Yes, evolution by natural selection follows the pressures of the environment, that is true. But the general consensus is that it actually is random at bottom. What Melvin's theory puts into the picture is that it follows the second law of infodynamics, so it's not random. The theory also shows that our world seems to be behaving much more like a computational system than anything else. The idea that we live in a simulation is not new, of course, and as many of you would know, I have my fair share of involvement with this idea, but here we have a meticulous framework coming from information physics that seems to be showing concretely processes in the world that follow a computational trend. There are many of them, and we're gonna go over some of them in our talk, but the rest of it you can check in Melvin's work. The links to both his paper and his book will be in the description. Obviously this claim is enormous and it will take in decades to either be vindicated or proven wrong. But now at least we have some evidence coming from physics that points to maybe this actually being the case. When you consider Melvin's work combined with recent works by people like Donald Hoffman, a picture starts to emerge. We definitely live in a very different environment than we previously thought we were in. So do we actually live in a simulation? Well, you decide for yourself. Here we're just presenting some of the evidence. And now, without further ado, I give you my conversation with Melvin Bobson. Melvin, how are you, brother? Not too bad. Happy New Year. Happy New Year indeed. Let's let's start from the most basics of why are we talking, why we were talking for a while and when we're talking here today. Your full name is Dr. Melvin Bobson. You're a physicist. Uh, if I understand correctly, you started from condensed matter and then you moved to theoretical physics. Is that correct? Information physics, yes. Yeah. Information physics, okay. And um, so, yeah, so we uh, we started chatting about maybe a year and a half ago, and I was really fascinated by your theory and work. And um, I invited you to come on my podcast and talk about your most recent paper that is making the rounds. And uh, I will let you outline what the paper, in fact, is uh what is your recent work about and what your paper is uh, purporting to have found? And then we can uh, have a little bit of a discussion back and forth about it. So, Danny, um, thank you so much for having me on your show. And um, uh, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, the paper um, you are um, referring to um, is um, the title is Second Law of Information Dynamics. Um, and certainly the paper brings about um, a new component in physics, um, a new, if you want, criteria for um, uh, establishing equilibrium of a given system in addition to minimization of total energy and um, uh, maximization of um, thermodynamic entropy. It appears to be another um, a requirement for physical systems and uh, in fact uh, universal it's applicable universally it's not just these biological even mathematical entities physical systems an additional requirement for the information content of a given system to be at a minimum value allowed at equilibrium like as as low as possible reaching a minimum um when the system achieves a, a, a stable or the most optimal um, conditions. And this is an additional tool that we have in, uh, in physics now to look at um, e equilibrium conditions and uh, look at um, some of the fundamental phenomena that we, we knew how um, they uh, behave, uh, and I'll get into the details a bit later, but we, we do have no explanation why they, they behave like this. Um, but now we have an additional tool that uh, can help us with this. I believe- Just for the layman, before you continue, just so people yeah. can, 
you know, because because you know it, 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 the language can become a little bit technical, and I want to make sure that people follow. Um, so essentially, and you correct me at any point that where I'm misstating it. Essentially, if you're correct, then you found a new universal regularity in nature, which is basically a new law of physics. It's the new law of physics, and 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 it is and it is a well. I guess we we, we can call all laws ultimately just regularities but yeah it, it it fits in the family of what we call the laws of physics um and essentially it's the uh, probably technically I'm wrong to call it an analog but it essentially is equiv- you equivocated with the second law of thermodynamics and that is the second law of infodynamics and in the most simplest way to explain it is just like the second law of thermodynamics states that uh, entropy always increases or stays the same over time and never decreases. There's a second law of infodynamics and informational systems that you go through biological systems, physical systems, computational systems. You show that there's an equivalent and inverse law that actually asymptotes towards uh, uh, increase, uh, decrease in entropy. Reduction. Re- reduction. Reduction, yeah. right. And you make a distinction in the book, I'm reading your book right now, and you make a distinction between the when we're talking about the information uh, entropy specifically of the thing that encodes versus the physical system, the information, the, the physical system state, which is different, mm-hmm. right? Correct, correct. Can, can you talk about that little difference for a second? Let's say in a hard drive. So yeah, um, uh, a quick um, correction on um, what you said. Uh, so um, you articulated very well exactly uh, what I mean. Okay, so you put it, you you summarize very well um, the, the, the you know the scientific case. Uh, the only correction is the fact that um, this um, entropy change in uh, physical systems, the second law of thermodynamics. And the converse um, um, law in information dynamics, um, the, 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 there is an extra requirement. The, the system has to be uh, isolated and uh, not uh, being pumped up with energy or um, any perturbations from the outside. So, for example, does the second law of thermodynamics requiring entropy to increase all the time? If you look at biological systems, um, they they don't back uh, this law. In fact, the entropy of a living organism is very low, um, highly organized uh, systems. So how is that possible? It's because they, uh, we take energy from the environment to reduce the entropy locally in, a, let's say, a biological um, organism. Uh, that's, what metab- we, that's what metabolism is, right? Exactly, but we do this at the expense of increasing the entropy of the environment. So overall, overall the entropy of everything always increases. When you stop the process of feeding energy into the system, then the, 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 the biological organism will decay into high entropy. You know, this when we die, dust to dust. It, that that's it. The, the, the highly organized state of biological, you know, the, the the you know the molecules, all the you know internal organs, everything that makes up a biological um, organism, completely decays into atomic constituents and um, a high entropy state. Uh, but that's when the process of uh, infusing energy into the system is completely um, eradicated. So uh, the, the same is with the information. So information tends to, you will have a reduction of information in a system uh, at equilibrium. But if you mess around with the system, if you add energy or if you create information, if you want, um, the system will change in a different way. It will increase the information entropy. So. We, we really look at um, things that um, are uh, left um, uh, isolated is the correct way and uh, uh, allow to evolve to an equilibrium state. Yes, then you have the two thermodynamic, the two second laws, if you want, one of the thermodynamic requiring entropy to increase all the time and the information dynamic, uh, uh, dynamic uh, requiring the entropy to find the minimum value, the most reduced value at most optimal value at equilibrium. That's that's correct. And they're interwoven, right? They are. So the function interwoven. So the function of one directly influences the other. So you can't have uh, encoding of information on a on a computational system. Like there, it's always in the informational system 
any production of information is always influencing a physical system uh, in some form of thermal heat. Is that correct? Or? <clears throat> well, any production of information, you will increase the, in, the overall entropy of a physical system. Okay. Okay. But what really happens is the following. Uh, imagine a, a device, a memory storage device. Okay. So it could be a hard disk drive or a, me a memory stick, a, a flash drive, something like that. And it's completely, the information is absent from the device. There is nothing in it. Okay. If you, we have means to actually compute the total entropy of that device. Okay. We, we can look at all the microstates possible, how you organize all the atoms and the, the crystals and everything. And we can get a number of the entropy of that device. Okay. That is the physical entropy. The, the, the moment you start creating information states into the device, in other words, writing information to the device. Okay. What you really um, are doing, the, 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 the device physically is not changing. It has the same volume, the same mass, the same components, the same um, structure. There is, there is nothing changing there, but you are, yet you are adding information somehow. So if you do magnetic data storage, for example, you simply modify magnetic states onto the surface of a disk, magnetic disk, so that magnetization up and down will correspond to zero and one, let's say, uh, logical states. Um, but the, the, the physical device itself has not changed. Okay. However, the states you created, the, these memory states, these zeros and ones that you created are additional microstates that now exist superimposed onto the physical state of the device. And for each, so if you are looking at binary, if you have n bit um, created, you have two to the power n additional microstates created. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that uh, information creation, or writing information into a digital device or by some means, increases the, the physical entropy of that system. So increasing the physical entropy, it means uh, you increase the, 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 the disorder if you want. And this is counterintuitive because writing information, one would assume that it's organizing uh, a system. It, it becomes more organized. You have data created, you have organization, you have, uh, you know, so you would expect the entropy maybe to decrease, but it's actually the physical entropy in reality increases. Uh, you are creating additional microstates two to the power uh, uh, n microstates for n bits, uh, and that is an increase in entropy. The interesting thing is what happened if you delete that, okay? So if you delete, um, and let's assume one bit only, uh, which takes me to Landauer, okay? Landauer realized uh, in 1960s, realized that um, the thermodynamic um, processes and the laws that govern thermodynamics, okay? It, there is no distinction, and there shouldn't be any distinction between the um, computational processes that govern the computational processes and, the com uh, you know, the computing rules and uh, the logic operations and all the things we do in computing should not be any different than um, the, the laws of thermodynamics, if you want, and the laws of physics applied to physical systems. The reason is a computer is a physical system that is part of the universe just like everything else. So it should obey the laws of physics. It is not isolated from our world, if you want. So it is, it is normal that uh, a logic operation uh, that takes place in a computer um, should be behaving and should be obeying the, the laws of physics. And this is a very abstract notion. It, it, it came about w with the development of digital technologies, computing technologies. Um, it was born out of uh, this symbiosis between physics and computation, you know, and digital technologies around, well, it started around 1940s, but 60s, 70s, it was already quite advanced. Uh, by 90s, we had internet. Um, so, um, and in it, in thermodynamics, there is a, there is a, um, a rule that a process that is um, irreversible, okay, it's automatically dissipative. In, in other words, um, it will 
uh, dissipate energy to the environment, okay? So what does it mean? It means, uh, and I give this example all the time, it means um, if I take a cup of coffee, and this initially is very hot, after a number of minutes, keeping the coffee here on the table next to me, the coffee will dissipate energy to the environment, it will reach an equilibrium with the room temperature of my office, and it will stay there as long as we don't do anything to it, adding energy to it or extracting energy from it or whatever. But this process, the key is that this process, the, the, um, it's irreversible, okay, irreversible, one, irreversible. There is no mechanism that the coffee will get hot itself by itself. It cannot happen. It will get hot if I put it into the microwave or heat it somehow or add energy somehow, but by itself it will never happen, okay? So this is a irre irreversible process. Secondly, by reaching equilibrium and dissipating this energy, uh, by reaching equilibrium, this irreversible process, it dissipated energy. It dissipated some of that heat and thermal energy to the environment, okay? So what Landauer said, he said, okay, that, that is what happened in thermodynamics with a cup of coffee or some other, you know, thermal processes or other things. But what about logical irreversibility? So if you have a logical process that is irreversible, just like a coffee cooling down from a high temperature, you have a logic uh, process that is irreversible, okay, can that dissipate energy? Okay, is that dissipative? Just like, because we, we just established the laws of physics should apply equally to computational processes. If you're saying logical process, you mean technical? You mean technical? Yeah, 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 I mean, I mean, I, I mean a, like a logic gate. Like a yeah. like a logic operation, like a transistor doing something, and and actually what Landauer did, he, he he the simplest logic process is the operation erase of a bit of information. So you take a bit of information, you imagine you have a bit onto a memory device, and you decide to apply a logic operation, say to your device, erase this information. Okay. Now, what you essentially you are doing, you are if it's only one bit, if you have n bits, you have two to the power n microstates superimposed to the physical state. If it's one bit, you have just um, two states, okay, two to the power one. So you have either magnetization up or down or zero or one, however you want to see it. But the key aspect is that if you erase that, okay, from existence, that is an irreversible process. That logic operation erase, the information will never rewrite itself, it will never spontaneously appear by itself. Once you erased it, just like that cup of coffee, it will never hit again to the initial state. So Landauer extrapolated this concept and said, if irreversible thermodynamic processes are dissipative, they dissipate energy, then logic operations like the operation erase of a bit of information, which is also irreversible, should also be dissipative. So it should dissipate some energy, okay? But that energy, where that energy comes from? That energy comes from the bit itself. Is because you are changing the... Uh, Isn't it you are the you... process of it being changed? So this is something that I read in your book, and I, 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 I guess I, I would need a little bit of your patience because, you know, a lot of these things that you swim in every day... Uh, both for myself and for the audience, uh, some of these things are not a given. So maybe I'll ask. They are not a given for me either. No, no, no. These are not simple. No, no, no. You're right. You're totally right. And uh, we we need to make an effort to explain this as well as possible. Okay. So my question to you is, and this is something that that came to me. One of my questions was ready for today as well. Should we not, by necessity, are, are we not um, obliged? to take into account in this process both the system that does the erasing like the logic the 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 the, the physical system that the logic gate is that contained in uh and also the the fact that the bit it's you're saying the information is in the bit itself if the bit itself would exist in a vacuum and there would be nothing else like a boltzmann brain but just a bit boltzmann bit right then it wouldn't mean anything. It, it It's not information. It's only information in relation to the fact that it is a something to an already an existing world. So now obviously we can't take into account the entire universe, but can't we at least, aren't we at least must 
take into account the little thing it's encased in. So like the bit only means something because it's a bit in something and also there's a thing that evokes no, we, it. No, we, we, you should not, you, you should completely dissociate the, the, the information um, stored in that information, if you want. When I talk about, maybe where I need to explain what I mean by information. When I, when I say information, I mean um, it's a mathematical function. It's the probability of an event to occur or not. Okay, it's a logarithmic of a probability of an event to occur or not. And um, when I talk about Shannon information, is exactly that applied to a number of events taking place. Okay, so if you have more than one event, there is a bit of a more complicated formula to calculate the, the content of information. But, but this does not tell you anything about the quality of the information. It doesn't tell you... So if you have some data stored um, onto hard disk drive in zeros and ones, let's say, where you have the winning lottery numbers from the national lottery uh, next Sunday, let's say. Okay. And they are stored into hard disk drive. That is a billion dollar, I don't know how much, you will, let's say $100 million prize money, okay? That is, okay. That's a very valuable piece of information. The, the same content, it could be stored in random bits that add up to nothing. They, 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 they could be arranged in a way that uh, they give you the same information content and the same information entropy using Shannon. But right. in if, terms of their meaning, in terms of their meaning, they add up to nothing. They are just random okay. bits. So we do not. So we're not talking about the meaning of it that we apply to it. No so meaning. The possibility of storing information bit. That's it. That, that's it. And it dissociate completely from what is stores and what is there. That that's that's not within the the framework of the theory. Maybe it's a gap in the theory. Maybe it's a it's only the content, pure content, no matter what the meaning is. Okay. Now you refer to the the, the overall system. It, when you talk about a bit of information being erased and stored, you have a much more complex system there. Uh, a whole mechanism that writes the data, uh, erases the data, a physical system where the bit is stored and all that. And I agree. I agree with that. There, there is nothing wrong to do with that. And this is exactly what is happening. When you are creating a bit of information, you increase the information entropy, the, the overall entropy by two microstates. One bit will give you two microstates, okay? Mm -hmm. You decide to erase that, okay? You are going to have the information, physical information, minus two. You, you erase the bit, you erase. So what you have done there in an isolated system, you reduced the information, uh, the overall entropy of the system. But we know from the second law of thermodynamics, the entropy cannot be reduced if the system is um, in, in an isolated system. You can, only, you, you can only stay constant or increase. So in order to, to avoid the violation of the second law of thermodynamics, that, that extra that reduction of entropy that you are doing by erasing information needs to be um, compensated by an energy dissipation into the physical system and an entropy increase into the physical system. In other words, you are not violating anything, you are not, you are not doing anything prohibited. And this is what Landauer said. He said that energy dissipation that goes in the system comes from the information itself. It increases the entropy of the system, so it doesn't violate any of the second law of thermodynamics this time, okay? And he gave a value of that um, energy, okay? It's Boltzmann constant times uh, temperature times logarithm 2, okay? That is the Landauer bound, and is the minimum, uh, it could be more than that, okay? But is the minimum uh, uh, energy associated with a bit of information, which will be dissipate it at erasure because it's an irreversible process and if it doesn't dissipate that it will violate the second law of thermodynamics you are going to reduce the <laughs> the entropy of the overall entropy of the system and that's not allowed so this needs to dissipate just like this coffee into the environment okay some energy and this is the process uh, what uh, what i did in 2019 i um, i uh, came up with if you want an extrapolation of Landauer's principle. And I said, okay, if a bit of information has a small, it's a physical, it's physical. That was the fundamental concept that Landauer um, came up with. The, the, the information is not just a mathematical construct. You know, it's not just zeros and ones that we, 
mathematically associate with states and stuff. It, it's actually physical, okay? Yeah, it sounds like an annihilation of a particle, basically. The erasure of that bit sounds like it, an it, annihilation. It's it exactly, exactly how it sounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I said, okay, so if that information comes off as dissipation from the bit when it's erased, where does it go and where is that energy when the bit is in a stable state storing information? And it can stay like this indefinite, okay? And this is where I came up with this analogy to explain it. If you have, imagine you have a, a, a scale, a balance, okay? And when it's fully balanced, it will stay equal height, okay? And let's say you associate a one logical one when this state is down, okay? And this one is up and vice versa. Okay, so this would be a zero and a one, okay? So how do you write a one, okay? You can come and press the balance or press it. You apply a force here, okay? And as long as you keep pressing, mm -hmm. okay, the balance will have a, a logical one written by tilting the left side, okay, down, okay? But if you stop pressing there, if you stop pressing, if you remove the, the excitation, you will come back in equilibrium. You have no information, okay? So the, 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 the way I um, conceive this is that that energy that Landauer talks about, okay, and that is dissipated at erasure, okay, coming from the bit itself, must condense into a small mass at equilibrium. So in other words, this is my balance. I put a mass here, it lowers. I have a one written here. As long as this mass is here, this is going to stay. If I want to erase it, I remove this. It goes back to I erase it. Okay, it's no longer there. It's energy dissipated. And this is how you can picture this concept of information having mass. And then when you erase it, you can't erase mass. You will just dissipate energy. Okay? So Landauer's principle has been proven experimentally in at least five, six articles, some of them in nature and science, okay? So I don't think anybody in the scientific community has any issue with this, with this Landauer principle. It has been peer-reviewed, published, and proven to be correct. Exactly the value that Landauer predicted has been measured experimentally is, is real. All I did was to say that if Einstein told us that energy is mass, okay, so E M C square, yeah, energy is equivalent to mass. And Landauer told us that information is equivalent to energy. All I did was to connect the dots and say that if energy is mass, mass um, information is energy, then energy, mass, and information are all the same thing. Is the triad of equivalence, what I call the mass energy information equivalence principle. And if information is mass, okay, and has mass, that makes information the fifth state of matter. Okay, the matter can only exist in a gas form, liquid form, plasma, or solid. But if information has mass, we have a fifth state now. Information, liquid, gas, plasma, and um, solids. And I want to go back to your question before you forget your question now, if you don't mind, yeah. Well, um, the first question is like super simple. Isn't Bose-Einstein condensate technically also considered to be a state of matter, or not really? Mm, it's a state of matter, yeah. It's, you bring into a very low temperature um, a, a, an atomic system, and essentially you, you create this Bose-Einstein uh, condensate. It's an exotic form of matter, I call it. It's, um, you know, it's not... Not an official state of matter. You have to... Not an official state of matter. It's not, yeah, it's... Um, it doesn't exist anywhere else but in a lamp, let's say. Exactly, it's artificially created. And when I, when I when I say the fifth state of matter, and I refer to information, uh, I I mean the expectation is that there, that there is a lot of it in the universe, a lot. And maybe is the dominant uh, component. Okay, maybe. Okay. And that's uh, the biggest, by the way, the big the biggest flash about your work, which is that it implies that we seem to be maybe living in a computational environment or a simulation, for lack of a better term. 
Well, this is it's a lot of buzz around this uh, this idea of a right. simulation. Um, yeah, you know, but, but but it's in it, in the title of the paper. So I'm not trying to allude to anything in particular, but it's in in the title of your paper. What we discuss up to this point is completely different to the second law of information dynamics. Completely okay. different. Okay. This okay. this is all the fundamentals that we need to understand in order to understand yeah, the second yeah, law. Yeah, but this is completely different to the second law. So the the, the stuff we we discussed about uh, uh, up to this point, it has a degree of speculation in it. Uh, it still needs some kind of um, experimental um, testing. I designed some experiments; they are not performed yet, um, and it's it's open for debate and interpretation. And it's still room for criticism and all sorts of things. When you go to the second law of information dynamics, that's a different ball game, because that is uh, <laughs> um, is. Uh, formulated on existing facts, existing data, empirical data. They, they, that is, is nothing um, controversial. There is nothing uh, that uh, it needs to be proven. It's, it needs to be expanded if you want. It needs to be applied to as much as possible in physics, you know, and uh, utilized as an extra tool, you know. But uh, uh, for what it is up to this point, there is nothing. You can't break it in any way. You can't dispute it because it's based on real data, real facts, experimental data, fundamental things. It, it, uh, so, while while so, while the mass energy information principle is a little bit, it's a little bit different. It it does make a number of I call them information conjectures. Okay, so it does make use of a few um, uh, assumptions. So let's put it like this: a few assumptions. Like, They're not proven. It, isn't it implied in Landau's work? Automatically, because Einstein discovered discover, because Einstein discovered that E equals MC square, doesn't it autom? If you think that information is equivalent to mass, doesn't it automatically by default means that it's equivalent to energy? Um, I don't know why nobody made that connection before, but um, yeah, Landauer. Uh, that's what I did. I connected the dots. Landauer um, postulated that information is energy and is physical. Um, Einstein, one of the great results of special relativity is the, the, the famous relation linking energy to mass. So we know energy is mass as well. So um, the, the, the rest, the, the dot connection and the, 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 you know, the, the postulation of this uh, mass energy information equivalence, that was my work. Now, I, I don't know why nobody came up with that before, but <laughs> um, Landauer would have been the natural, you know, proponent of this you know he, he came up with this fundamental idea that the uh, information is physical you know it, it would have been a a, a a minor stretch to link it to mass and energy and um it would be where we are now yeah okay so thank you for that clarification that's actually an important yeah. distinction there uh so let's yeah. dive into the second law of infodynamics uh how does everything we discussed so far flow into your work and and, but like you said, it's it's based more on concrete things that you observed that you count exactly yes and yeah and, and actually um, uh, Danny the, the the second law of information dynamics um, is I, I kind of came uh, came around this um, almost um, it was it was intent my studies were intended for something else I was not trying to discover this or look for this or uh, I was completely looking at something else. I was essentially I was playing with a, a software that I wrote um, uh, designed to calculate the information entropy of uh, a genomic sequence. OK, so you take a genomic sequence of something. It could be anything, a butterfly, a squirrel, a human genome. Uh, but at that time, I was uh, specifically playing around with uh, SARS-CoV-2. So this is the COVID-19 um, the, 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 the RNA sequence of the virus that produced the COVID-19 pandemic. So, um, and I, I wrote a software and I, I was doing a few interesting things with that, okay, using Shannon information theory. So, so, and by doing this, I observed something very interesting, okay? I noticed that uh, if you take the original genome from Wuhan, 2019, December, okay, so the very first um, sequence um, of SARS-CoV-2, and you calculate the information entropy, okay, you get a value. It's just a value of the whole genome, okay, you get one value. Um, and then you, you, you pick some variants of this SARS-CoV-2 
acquired and sequenced at later time, let's say six months later, a year later, a year and a half, different variants that obviously are not the same. They suffered some mutations, okay? They mutated and they are variants, okay? Uh, the longer the time from the original sequence and the original uh, virus, the more mutations they will undergo, yeah? And, uh, but what I found is that if you take the information entropy of mutated variants at later time, that value scales inverse proportionally to the number of genetic mutations. So let me translate this for your uh, listeners. In other words, the more mutations a genome suffers, the lower the information entropy becomes. And it's not just the fact that it, it seems to of be like... Mutation, a, of the mutation of the state of the genome in the moment. No, no, no. The, 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 the overall the rate of mutation or the actual state of the genome? The, the whole genome has an information entropy, okay? You, yeah. you calculate it for the original. And then, you, let's say, it suffers five mutations. At, okay. uh, like a later time, you sequence the same virus. Five months later, it has five mutations. And then you calculate again using the same software, the same procedure, the information entropy of that new genome, the, 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 the variant. I notice that is lower. Okay. So it's so, great. Okay. So, so it's lower. Then I, I noticed, okay, seven mutations lower further. Ten mutations, even lower. Okay, and it keeps decreasing, it keeps decreasing. In other words, if you do a plot of the genetic uh, number of genetic mutations as a function of the information entropy, you find a, a negative slope, a straight line with a negative slope. Now, I need to disclose here that the data I present in my book and um, uh, in the papers, it, you cherry pick the best data to show a nice trend there, okay? But the truth is that uh, every genome that suffered mutations had a lower entropy than the original one, with no exception. Every single one. So when I saw this, okay, the first thing that um, um, the, 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 the big eureka moment is the fact that this appears to contradict Darwin's um, evolution theory. In what way? Um, the Darwin's evolution theory and the consensus globally now in, in science is that genetic mutations are not driven by any process. They are completely random. There is nothing governing genetic mutations. The only thing that governs evolution is natural selection. So okay. the environmental pressure can mean that it will the the mutation will increase decrease over time. We don't know. That's that's what it means. No, that, that there is there is a there is a there is a driving force in the environmental um, um, aspects. Okay, so if you take an organism and uh, place it into an environment where maybe it's a higher temperature, over time it will evolve and adapt and mutate to adapt to to live in that higher temperature environment, sort of. So, but. What I'm saying is if you take a, an organism and keep it in an isolated system, ideal conditions, okay, and you sequence it over time, okay, the genetic mutations will take place in such a way that the information entropy will decrease. But, so, but, I'm, but, I'm, but, but this is important. But the difference is what, you, again, to the people who don't know, according to the theory of uh, now Darwin, neo-Darwinism. So they are random. Completely random. Random. So, which which means that technically they should be able the number of mutations over time might increase according to the evolution theory. Uh, and the difference uh, that you found they have that to. it only decreases. No, so, you found that it only decreases. But I'm no the number of mutations. No, yeah. what it what decreases is the information entropy. Okay. The so the the graph that I'm plotting is vertical axis information entropy. Okay. Which is a, a value per genome. Okay. The, hori the horizontal axis is the number of mutations. Okay. So the more mutations you have, the lower is the information entropy. Got it. This graph should not exist. There should not be any correlation according to the consensus and according to the uh, evolution theory and Darwinistic view of uh, biology and everything. There shouldn't be any correlation whatsoever between infor the, between any physical parameter or mathematical parameter and the genetic mutations. They should be completely random. Now, when you find a straight line, even if you believe in coincidences, it is not a straight line through two points. <laughs> you have a, 
a, a data set and it, it, it goes through a straight line, then um, that's one of the, those big moments when you think, wow, uh, what is this about? This should not happen. Right. So this is how the second law of information dynamics um, uh, was born. Because when I realized this, first I realized that this goes against evolution theory and Darwinistic view and stuff. There seems to be a governing law, an entropic, uh, hidden entropic force that governs genetic mutations. They are not random. Okay? They scale in a straight line with uh, this information entropy. That shouldn't happen. But then the second idea was, wait a second, could this be something more fundamental that is not just applicable to um, uh, RNA and DNA, you know, to biological information. Could this be something that is applicable to uh, other systems, maybe maybe a universal law, okay? And this is when I started to look at um, uh, uh, expanding this idea, okay, and verifying against other systems. Uh, in the original paper, I... Uh, I looked at uh, RNA of SARS-CoV-2 and uh, digital systems like uh, magnetic data storage if you want and that was a little bit coming up with a new law of physics second law of information dynamics based on two systems one biological one micromagnetic simulation that was a little bit of a stretch there it was a bit a bit rich to you know it, it took guts to come up with that uh, but th that was my pure intuition it was just I, I had a feeling that I'm on to write something there, you know. Um, so you found a but, common formational thread that runs from physical to chemical to biological, and it it's applied it took, to all of them. It took it took another year for that. It took another year. So the first publication was 2022. It was quite reduced. It was just the the SARS uh, SARS-CoV-2 data and um, uh, a simulation of a. a the magnetic data storage system, digital data storage. Um, but we took another year to expand this and look at a few other things and find find a common denominator, you know, find find the, the universality of this um, permeating into different things. And, uh, and what I found, I found that if you, um, for the, 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 the very interesting thing is actually, um, I don't know whether I should be, uh, yeah, let, let's go to Pauli's uh, exclusion principle and uh, Huhn's rules, okay? It, it just happens I was uh, teaching a lecture at um, uh, my uh, multiferroics unit um, at the University of Portsmouth, and uh, at the very beginning I'm I'm covering things like um, uh, the the origin of magnetic phenomena in solids, looking at um, Bohr magnetron and the magnetic orbital moments and spin magnetic moments and all the stuff. Uh, and to, to, to calculate um, the Landé factor and all these things, and to calculate these um, parameters, you need to actually start populating electrons on orbitals and, um, and work out the, the total spin, uh, uh, you know, the total um, angular orbital momentum, um, work out a, a few things. And um, so I was doing this uh, on the board and uh, explaining uh, how you actually use Pauli's exclusion principle and Huhn's rules to populate these electrons on the orbitals. They don't just reside um, randomly. They have to follow specific rules. Pauli's um, exclusion principle requires um, uh, no two fermions to have the same quantum numbers uh, in, in the same state at the same time. So you, you need to have a distinguishable mechanism to distinguish two electrons, for example. Uh, they need to be something different, okay, in them. Uh, and so when they reside on, uh, on an orbital, what distinguishes them is the spin. So they have the same N number, the same L number, the same um, uh, uh, MS uh, uh, number, magnetic quantum number. Th what they have different, otherwise they will violate Pauli's uh, principle. They need to have the spin up and spin down. So if you have an S orbital that can take two electrons only, they can't be spin up, spin up, or spin down, spin down. They need to be spin up, spin down. Otherwise, they're not distinguishable. They violate uh, Pauli's principle. Um, so within this Pauli's principle, then if you have more than S orbitals, you have S, P, D, F orbitals, more electrons, they start populating following another rule called Huhn's rule. Okay? So you fulfill Pauli's uh, principle, and then you follow another rule called Huhn's rule, how they populate. Now, this is interesting now, because 
you can find a number of ways of populating electrons on orbitals by fulfilling Pauli's principle, but only one of those different configurations fulfills Hund's rule. Only one is correct. But there are multiple or, uh, arrangements possible that are compliant with the Pauli's exclusion principle. Only one is correct in terms of Hund's rule. We are talking about the stability of chemicals, the stability of matter in the universe, the stability, how the atoms are, <laughs> you know, populated with electrons. That if these rules are not followed to the <laughs> dot, okay, we, we don't have a world the way, the way it is. There is nothing stable, okay? So they are fundamental. to explain Hun's rule in... Hun's rule, uh, you need to have uh, the, 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 the spins will organize themselves so the, 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 the maximum total spin is achieved. They achieve the maximum spin. So to if get, you have so uh, to, together, they add up to the maximum spin. Okay. Okay. And the exclusion this, principle is basically that no uh, uh, fundamental. They don't. They can't have two electrons on the same quantum state with all the quantum numbers the same. They can't have. Okay. And then you have to populate so they achieve the maximum spin. This is Hund's rule number one. Okay. Anyway, this rule doesn't have. It's a phenomenological observation. It's an empirical observation. We know this is happening like this. Okay. And we are talking about, by the way, the ground state. We are talking about atoms in the ground state. So not excited states, not very low temperature, uh, be like the Bose Einstein condensate you mentioned, like almost zero Kelvin ground state, how they populate, okay? But we know this is happening. We know this is happening. We, we just, the, the Hund's rule has no explanation, okay? So uh, I was teaching this. I was trying to explain the rule to the students. And then I had this idea, wait a second. If you see these electrons spin up and spin down as zeros and ones, whereby you allocate a zero and a one to a spin up or spin down, you see them like information states or a message in Shannon information uh, uh, theory, um, you know, uh, as an information co coding system, if you want. If you see them like this, what happened if you calculate the information entropy, okay, or the information content, of each configuration possible as permitted by Pauli's exclusion principle. And what I found, this is very interesting, what I found is that without exception, the configuration that is the correct configuration to populate electrons on orbitals corresponding to the Hund's rule, okay, that configuration without ex exception has always the lowest information content or the lowest information entropy. Always. So it's always just like the you know, to stay it, as low as it possibly can. It 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 chooses the minimum value. So that was that was big because first we have finally a governing explanation why the electrons behave like this. They seem to be optimizing um, the information content. Okay, uh, just like the Pauli exclusion principle behaves like variables in a computer code where you cannot have if you want to have let's say four variables they have four quantum numbers okay if you have to have four variables and they do different things different functions different different um uh, they undergo different executions in the program if the if the, the four variables are not distinguished distinguishable from each other the program will not function it will completely crash or do something else you need to have them labeled so you can distinguish between the four variables if you want. The same appears to be uh, with these atomic systems. The Pauli exclusion principle insists of this distinguishability. Uh, the, uh, the most densely populated uh, states of matter where electrons stay together and they need to be distinguishable and they seems to resemble computational processes and the way we write computer programs and everything. But, but the, the second aspect is the fact that they organize themselves in a way that the total information content is always minimal. Minimal. Information entropy is minimal always in the ground state, okay? So now you have digital information, now you have genetic information uh, obeying this, now you have atomic systems and the way, uh, you know, um, electrons populate chemicals and molecules and orbitals and stuff. Um, and And... It wasn't quite enough for me, and I, I took a look at another system. And this time I, uh, I um, 
this is a uh, this is so um incredible that uh, it, 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 it's almost hard to explain um so the our world is dominated by symmetry our universe is dominated by symmetry symmetries are abundant everywhere okay so you see symmetry in platonic crystals you see symmetry in molecules symmetry in um, uh, cells and biological life in dna uh, symmetries in the laws of physics, symmetries everywhere, okay? Fractals and all sorts of um, um, highly organized things. So the question is, why why the universe choose symmetry rather than asymmetry? Okay, why, why if you take my uh, human face, for example, and we have two eyes and the full symmetric shape, we have a symmetry axis here, why the head is not completely asymmetric? Why we don't have asymmetry rather than symmetry? Okay, and, and plants and all sorts of things. And um, this is a question that is not, it had no answer. Okay, why do, do the universe choose symmetry rather than asymmetry? And this is even more bizarre if you think that the second law of thermodynamics dictates that everything evolves to high disorder, high entropy. Okay, everything in the universe moves into high entropy, high disorder state. How can you equate the fact that symmetries are so abundant everywhere and the, 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 the universe is so well organized and there is complexity and all this stuff when this entropic force requires high disorder, high entropy. So these are very bizarre um, aspects, you know, uh, you know, this, particularly this symmetry, uh, which is a mathematical concept, really. Symmetry is a uh, is related to an operation uh, that is applied to an object, let's say the, the shape of, of, of an object, and um, uh, it, it, it leaves an object or the shape of an object or some properties of an object invariant upon um, some kind of transformation, okay? And uh, we call these symmetry operations. They take place around the symmetry um, elements and so on. So this is the background of this symmetry, okay? The symmetry problem. Now, I what I did, uh, coming back to the second law of information dynamics, you know, this information content and minimization of information content. What I did, I um, I took a look at some simple Euclidean um, geometric shapes, um, triangles, this kind of stuff, and I um, worked out all the permutations possible of um, these shapes. And for each possible arrangement, I calculated the information entropy or the information content of that shape. Okay? And long behold, what I found is that the highest symmetry, the most symmetric shape, always corresponds to the lowest information content or the lowest information entropy. Just like uh, the genomes mutate and evolve to the lowest information entropy. Just like Atoms populate uh, themselves with electrons on the orbitals, taking the lowest information entropy. Just like digital data will um, evolve into a lower information entropy, uh, doing self erasure and um, uh, all sorts of other processes. But now we have these mathematical entities that are, it's a construct, it's a mathematical concept. Yes, it permeates everything in the universe, it seems to be fundamental, it seems to be connecting chemistry with biology and mathematics and everything, yes, is the symmetry is more fundamental, okay? But but even here, this second law of information dynamics appears to be um, applying very well and kicking in and being responsible for the abundance of symmetry, if you want, in, in the universe, okay? It seems to be an obeyance of this second law of information dynamics. That's why. Um, and this is... If you believe in coincidences, happy days, but when you have so many diverse systems all um, uh, responding to this underlying, you know, this governing law, um, I don't think it's an overstatement, uh, you know, extrapolating and saying this has all the features of a uh, fundamental law that seems to be applicable at universal scale. Now, why why this points to an info, uh, a simulation, uh, you know, uh, concept? Uh, why this points to a universe being a computer, um, 
the simulated construct if you want um, because it behaves like the way we would do if we write a computer code and we want to optimize it this second law of information dynamics does exactly what we would do to optimize the functionality the data storage the computation process and everything into a computer code okay it seems to be um, um, like a built-in mechanism optimization mechanism that applies to everything in the universe and because it's a derivative from Shannon information entropy the father of digital computing the guy who gave us the the unit of a bit of information <laughs> the, the unit of a bit comes from Shannon information entropy so the fact that this is um, actually interlinked 100 percent to this computational process and information theory and it seems to be applicable and permeating everything in the universe it is a strong indication that maybe maybe the whole world is a computational process some kind of simulation does it uh, offer um, the the total proof of that no it's just uh, a logical conclusion that needs additional research additional um, support additional uh, maybe experimentation and other things but um, certainly that is a valid conclusion is a, a possible the real possibility um, if, if that's not the case the second law of information dynamics stands as it is stands it's another tool in physics it's something that should be used to look at the stability of um, systems to look at um, equilibrium states to look at um, uh, revisit almost everything uh, from this angle and see what we can learn and how we can optimize things how we can do things better it's another tool in physics just like the first law of thermodynamics second law of thermodynamics all the things that we we use in you know mathematics and calculus and everything this is another another um, another thing that we have now so uh, so this is what i'm very excited but the fact that it points to a simulation it's it's undeniable it, it, it it's a valid possibility yes would it be safe to say that what because once you say the, when you say the word simulation people just think the matrix and I think that's what, yeah. what, 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 once again, I want, I want to outline something here. So would it, would it be safe to say in the most conservative way possible, whatever it is, it behaves like a computer. So even if, if whatever at the bottom yeah. is computation, even if we don't understand what it really is, yeah. whatever yeah. it is, at the moment, as you look at it, that second law of infodemics behaves like an optimization of a computational system. And I think this is better articulated the way you put it um, than than the way I said it. Okay, so I think that's no. I think it would, the, all the details you said are very important. I'm just trying to dial it into something people can kind of you know the, digest. No, I, I totally I totally agree. And um, in fact, th there are other views. For example, if you look at uh, uh, the work of um, Seth Lloyd from uh, MIT, um, he wrote uh, quantum computers. Uh, he works on right. He, well, he works on on quantum computing and quantum mechanics, but he uh, wrote about uh, the universe being a giant computer, essentially, which computes itself. So he he came up with uh, this concept and he has some valid, um, you know, uh, arguments there through theoretical physics and uh, th different, different um, uh, approaches that um, he concluded that the universe is a giant computer that computes itself. So he's no a simulation as in the matrix where somebody is behind running this is just like you said it behaves like a computational process and that second law of information that appears to support that now it could be the Seth Lloyd's uh, version where is uh, the, the whole universe is a giant so, computer yeah, yeah yeah it's a self-contained system exactly yeah. or it could be a simulation I, 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 I can't speculate on that of okay? course this is your physicist in the end of the day and this is yeah. so let, let me define this next a few minutes as completely speculative we're not saying anything of substance here this is just like for the fun of it but also actually this is a question that i had for you uh, on the theoretical side but maybe it might be tied to something more concrete my question is are there any processes that you can think of even in theory that might point to 
if if let's say we're being simulated by another civilization, giant if we don't know, just want to put this caveat out there. Um, but let's are there any experiments or processes we can look at that might tell us what is this external system, or will it always be the case that because the other system in whatever higher space, if it's simulating us, because it's simulating us, it can technically be completely decoupled and it will leave no trace or evidence of what it actually is? Or do you think there are ways to determine what this external hard drives might look like or what laws of physics it might... Nah, it's a, I, I get it, I get it. This is, um, Danny, this is a very, um, very good question, actually. And um, it doesn't have a simple answer, but um, uh, again, I, I can, like you stated, um, I can speculate a little bit. Completely hypothetical. And, uh, so, um, the, if you look at um, the, the, some of the uh, evidence we have uh, from physics and uh, some of the weirdness that we um, observed in physics, things like quantum entanglement, things like uh, the double slit experiment, where the outcome of the experiment depends on the observer and the observation. Uh, the observation uh, appears to change the outcome of the experiment, the mere observation, okay? of the experiment. So it seems to be an observer, um, a conscious uh, observer dependent um, process that affects our reality. Um, so if you, if you actually plug in these um, real things that we know from physics, okay, they are not, these are not speculations, these are facts. But if you plug these in from the, the simulation uh, angle, and then you bring the human consciousness uh, into the equation, then you realize that uh, maybe our role here, maybe we are not so disconnected from this. Maybe our consciousness is somehow part of this process or, or a component or an active, we are almost like active agents of this. Uh, and if that is the answer, uh, there you have your experimentation, um, 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 a root, if you want, your, your hacking mechanism into the matrix um, it's in ourselves, okay, and our consciousness that perhaps is the best gateway to to enter into this or or to to see beyond, if if you want. Uh, I'm interested in the physics side, looking yeah, at physical evidence. But if we find a way to inject the observer into physical equations, then physicists can do something with it. And I think it's just it, that because there's no way at the moment nobody can even think of a way to do that. That's yeah. why the insistence. Go so, so for example, you always, whenever somebody says who's not a physicist like yourself, yeah. whenever somebody echoes what you just said, which is you know Dean Radin's experiment with the observer influencing it, the pushback that you get from physicists and people who are like scientifically minded is, well, one second, what they mean in the experiment when they say the observer. They don't mean a person. They mean an apparatus, the detector, the, the yeah, photo detector, detector yeah. right? But you, they're forgetting. Well, this is my contention, and then you can give me your thoughts on that. But you still have somebody knowing this, and I know it's exactly. not a thing you no. would do an equation. But that's a fa like you can't talk about that outside of you experiencing it. They did this experiment in so many sophisticated ways, using delayed uh, choice, using. Um, outcomes uh, sealed in envelopes and being opened at a later time and stuff. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, trust me, there, there is a, a conscious observation <laughs> that changes the outcome. Okay, so this is it's something to do with us. Okay, so you heard it here from a physicist. Yeah, so <laughs> it seems it seems to be it seems to be this. Um, um, so if that's the case, then perhaps. I don't know, some kind of approach involving physics and neurosciences and um, uh, metaphysics, or I, I don't know, I, I, this will be just speculation, but probably an easy gateway to, to this would be still through our minds and consciousness and stuff. I, I, this is just a speculation. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'll ask you a few rapid questions. Um and uh, and then we can you know we can we can sum it up. This is this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Dan. Just just for me in a book, or maybe I misunderstood. Why did the why why did the, the why does the theory ignore antiparticles and neutrinos? 
Because it says anything but antiparticles and neutrinos. Or, no, that, I misunderstand. That's a very good question. So, um, the, the 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 reason I ignored antiparticles is because I was working out uh, the, the the probabilities. Uh, so I I I worked out the, the information content of elementary particles based on their abundance in the universe. Okay, so you essentially look at what percentage of atoms of each kind you have in the universe, how many electrons, how many protons, how many neutrons, how many, you work out with the quarks and everything. And from those probabilis probabilistic numbers, you can work out some value of using Shannon information again, of how much information would be stored or how much information content would be um, located per elementary particle. Now, uh, we know that we have antiparticles, but these are very a, they are not stable, uh, and uh, and then B, uh, it, their component of the visible universe is insignificant. So it, it, it's a very small, so I, I completely ignore them. For the neutrino, uh, I only consider particles that have uh, a, a rest mass. And um, so, so I didn't take photons, for example, into any bosons, anything that has no uh, uh, rest mass, okay? Um, and the neutrino is still a big question around whether it has mass or not, okay? A rest mass. Uh, so Can it be the equivalent of kinetic energy of information? No, it has to be the, 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 the mass energy information equivalence principle um, refers to stable bits um, stored at equilibrium at rest. Uh, classically, not quantum states, not anything like that. Okay, so it, it has a the, the 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 state is very well defined. And if you have something that doesn't have a rest mass, so if you, you cannot take a photon and stop it, okay, what a photon can do, it can take information and carry that information and transfer it from A to B, but it does not store the information in the way I describe that information entropy relationship and because it doesn't have the, the ability to be it doesn't have like on on it can't rest on a thing well and, and also because uh if information has mass at rest um or non-rest whatever information has mass then a particle that has no mass would violate i mean having information in it you will have to acquire mass somehow and that's that's a violation but we know the 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 the, the fermions are uh, you know, the matter particles, if you want, and the, the bosons are the force interaction particles. So they, 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 they carry the interactions and they mitigate the interactions between uh, different things, you know, the fermions and different things in the universe. So uh, a photon, we, we do it all the time. I have optical fiber communication at my house now. Uh, the internet comes through, you know, uh, photons. But do they store information? No, they, they transfer information. Storage of information is a bit different, okay? And it does require particles to have, uh, at least that was my view and I explained in the paper. They need to have a non-zero rest mass and they need to be <laughs> making up the visible universe and the antiparticles is not, we don't see antimatter everywhere. You know, we can make it in the lab, we, <laughs> we can, <laughs> you know, we, we, can, we can manipulate some, I don't know, some positrons or some, uh, in some ways, but it's not, it will annihilate very quickly, it's not stable. Um, so that's the reason I didn't consider. But I kind of violated my own, my own rule because in 2022 I formulated an experiment using matter-antimatter annihilation to look for information. <laughs> um, so in that experiment I make the assumption that uh, an electron and a positron, the, its antiparticle, holds information, each one of them will hold information, but in my original um, calculation of the information content of elementary particles, I completely ignore the antiparticles, okay? Um, although later on I I assume they, they do have information themselves as well, so, uh, but because there are so few, perhaps it's okay to actually, you know, there, there is not an abundance of antimatter, the, the universe is dominated by ordinary matter, uh, well, dark matter and dark energy, but the visible universe is ordinary matter. Which you talk about in the paper, by the way. You connect it all yeah, to, to a yeah. potential computational system. Okay, so I have, I'm going to ask you one more question by uh, Giuseppe from Italy, or Pepe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I'm just going to read it as it is. Uh, your recent discovery, discovery of a new law of physics suggests the possibility that our reality might be a simulation. This concept has stricken par parallels with the brain in a vet, thought experiment proposed by Hilary Putnam. According to Putnam, if our brains were sustained by computer simulated all sensory experiences, we would be unable to determine whether our perceptions are real or simulated. In relation to this discovery, how do you believe we can distinguish between reality and simulation? So I guess it's, to some degree, it's a, it echoes the, what I basically asked you is like, um, or, or do you take the question differently? I, I don't take it in any shape or form. I, it's, it's a very good question. It's not easy to answer and, um, yeah, um, yeah, and I'm, I'm, you, by the way, I'm not, I'm, I'm, not as a physicist, in your personal view, would you say my, that is, is experience real, like that's what real means as long as you have the experience, it doesn't matter how it was? The, my, my view, and I, I, actually, I actually write about this in the book, my view is that uh, there is no, whether we're in a simulation or not, it makes absolutely no difference to our life. We have no reference frame to distinguish what is real and what is not real. Even if we are in a simulation or if we are not, we can't, we can't tell and it will change nothing in terms of our everyday life. What it changes is what's beyond death, if you want. What changes is uh, how we look at the physics and how we look at the laws of physics and how we uh, try to advance our understanding, maybe trying to hack into this simulation if there is one. Uh, but, but in terms of our um, everyday life in our our perceptions our experiences it will make no difference they, they we can't distinguish we simply don't have a reference frame to distinguish what is real and what is not real so the experience is all that is big basically being in the moment so like the very good exactly yes yes one yes. well, final thing i want to ask you about is more of a human element here so for non people who are not scientists maybe it's not that clear as to like how you know a pro scientific process goes, especially in the hard science like physics. Um, this paper is at the moment peer reviewed. Yeah. Yes. We send it to a journal, and uh, if the journal has a peer review process in place, which most of them do, okay, all of them basically do, um, the journal will um, select a peer reviewer, okay, or two or three or whatever, and it goes to some expert in the field. Uh, they send back their comments. Sometimes they demand changes or corrections. Sometimes they reject um, outright. They find some gross errors and your work is rejected. Um, other times, um, maybe they find something, some serious flaws in, the, in, the, in the, the argument and they require some significant um, revision, you know, to, to a manuscript. Um, there are different outcomes when you submit a paper. You, you, it, it depends uh, on on the peer review. Yes, it's peer review. So, th so this in, in my case, I had uh, to to be honest. In in my case, the peer review came um, quite um, um, strong. Actually, the the first iteration of the peer review it came quite strong, and in response to that, to actually convince the peer reviewer that uh, what I'm talking about is solid stuff. I added an, an extra chapter, so um, all the things about the symmetries I, I've been discussing and they appeared in the paper, they were meant to appear in a different article. I felt that um, uh, uh, another discovery within discovery, if you want, like why there is symmetry in the universe, and it seems to be the second law of information dynamics uh, governing this. Uh, I felt that would make a, an article on its own, uh, elaborated nicely and expanding the, uh, you know, the, 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 the study. It will make a nice article on its own. And I was keeping that under the carpet. I was, I was not ready to share that. But um, when the peer review came with a long list of, I had 11 pages, <laughs> um, a peer review um, list of comments. And um, I had to address all those comments. And uh, I felt, okay, perhaps maybe it's time to show everything now. And I, I added an extra chapter in addition to uh, other changes that I had to make to the paper and uh, additional explanations. I added an extra chapter, and that was the, the symmetry uh, bits, um, which made it a bit stronger and we convinced the reviewer that, you know, uh, just give the final stamp of approval and uh, say, yeah, uh, publish it. But um, 
But you need to understand that and your listeners, the peer review process is a very subjective and um, imperfect uh, process. Um, and uh, in some cases, very political as well, especially some of the big journals uh, with big impact factors and stuff. Um, I, I tend to keep distance from very important journals and stuff. Uh, the, for, the first reason is it takes forever to get a paper published. It takes over a year in Nature and uh, other journals. Uh, during this time, your idea is uh, shared with a number of people and editors and other people. And um, um, it's already in the public domain. Um, anybody can, uh, you know, back on it, write on it, publish it, yeah, re 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 rebrand it, repurpose it, and and get it uh, in the public domain at a significant segment of time before you your paper, if you're lucky enough to get accepted. So uh, I, 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 my, my, my strategy is to go for um, journals that um, have a fast peer review process a fast publication process and um, I tend to choose um, open access uh, journals because it gives you more exposure so people in the countries where um, maybe the scarcity of you know the budget and library is not um, funded enough to to pay for subscription to an important journal uh, if it's an open access journal anybody can access it anybody freely freely you just download and read the paper and that gives you more exposure, um, you know, more citations. Uh, it gets... It's much more democratic. It's much more what it should be. Well, many funding agencies actually are making it a requirement if you are funded by a, a given fund, funding agency to publish all the work in open access. It is becoming a requirement now. Uh, I do it uh, without funding. <laughs> I, it's, I I wasn't funded by anybody to do this work. But, so, uh, by the way, that that was what my question was targeted towards, actually. So the second part of this question is, after it's peer-reviewed, why, if if an idea is so revolutionary, right, and it, it relatively, in the book you and in the paper, you propose a relatively cheap way to try and construct an experiment, right? Yeah. What it, it, Walk us through shortly... What are the main impediments? Like if somebody is watching this and they have a deep pocket and they say, oh my God, this is crazy. I want to fund this. Why does it take in the amount of money available in the world for, for uh, you know, research and, and, and experiments? Is it that hard to convince uh, other people in the community that this is worth pursuing if, if the potential outcome is such a radical transformation of our understanding of at least one portion of our world? So it comes back to this um, statement I made about the peer review process. Um, the, the the way funding works, you know, research funding, I mean, uh, from funding agencies is not very dissimilar to the peer review process for publications. It's a process uh, that is um, very subjective, is not objective. It's run by uh, people for people and is um, full of imperfections and uh, it's it's actually a very political process as well okay so um essentially if you let me give you an example if i if i am and it shouldn't be happening but this is happening if i write a grant on a piece of research and uh, my grant goes to peer review panel or to a peer reviewer okay that works it, it has to be an expert in that field okay and it just happens that the, the, the guy or an ex-academic works in the same research field as i do and is a competitor and maybe they they work on a very similar idea. If they found me, I'm gonna get ahead of them with <laughs> with the work. Um, and there is an incentive there not to actually to reject um, things that are seen as competitive to someone's research field. On the same sort of like philosophy, if I if someone submits a research idea for funding to an, an agency, and that research idea ends up in the hands of a reviewer and and the research proposed in the grant contradicts 20 years of research of that specific academic. He says everything that we, like I say about Darwin, okay? <laughs> Would you come and say, uh, you know, the genetic mutations are not random processes. They appear to be governed by uh, a hidden law, okay? And I would like to study this. If, if, if someone's entire academic life has been built on this idea that genetic mutations are random and they 
uh, you know this this philosophy and this scientific view and the consensus how how they say there will be a strong incentive it shouldn't happen but it, it's human nature it's human there will be a strong incentive to say because they are being asked to judge whether this research deserves funding or not and they could simply say you can't judge academic ju- judgment if an academic says my judgment is that this is not valid argument or is incorrect or is um, it has a number of errors or nobody can go and judge that judgment because it's supposed to be totally independent trying to get funding for um, this kind of research and this kind of experiments uh, from research funding agencies is a no-go uh, I would just be wasting my time I believe uh, because uh, because I tried with down to earth projects which had huge potential for commercialization and industrial impact and scientific impact and they many many of them didn't even enter the peer review process okay they got <laughs> so the, the, the well, 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 you reach a point where it, it, it actually you are wasting too much time writing grants and seeking funding rather than using that time to do the research you know is um it, there is a trade-off and um, so I I think going to the official channels you know like funding agencies and stuff uh, is not is not a good idea but 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 there is another avenue there is the the option of having um, a, a tech entrepreneur for example or a, a company uh, we talk about data storage so you have all these mega billionaire multi-billion dollar companies like CK Western Digital all these people okay uh, an experiment that would link them to that outcome and that experiment, the experiment, and they would be funding it. That that's totally feasible. Uh, the, 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 this good PR for the company is good. Um, somebody which has, um, like you metaphorically said, a deep pocket <laughs> uh, and uh, genuinely interested in in the science or um, trying to find a way out of the matrix or God knows, you know, like genuine interest in this. It's just pocket change, you know, is 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 nothing. Uh, it's just breaking through the the barriers and and trying to get the message across. And um, and uh, I had a crowdfunding campaign um, for something like two hundred thousand uh, pounds to to build the experiment. I managed to make two point five percent of that. <laughs> so um, it was. I was grateful that a hundred five or hundred seven. Uh, backers, uh, you know, donated to to the campaign. Uh, it's just um, incredible. But um, the, I, I, do you think I, that's I, a product? But do you think it's a product of not enough people actually understand the true validity and the and the the, the th- so it's like you know if it would be something about like a little toy that everybody can see and understand. I feel like maybe there's a cer- certain barrier there. You, you you don't think that's possible? Danny, to be honest. Um, would you want to know if you if we are in a simulation? Would you would you be happy to actually have here is a budget, here is an experiment, do it, and then let's say you find out that yes, Jesus, we we live in a simulation. You find would you be happy about that? Because I'm telling you something. I I would. Well, again, I had to I would face that happy. question. I understand yeah. you wouldn't be happy, but it, the, it yeah. notice that that's a weird um, upper bound to knowledge that. Like it's almost like we say, look, we're gonna follow the scientific method until this point. Then we shouldn't know. I, I know. <laughs> like, I, I, I agree. It, it, yeah, I, I it's, like, agree, it's but... because because it feels to me that look, whatever the truth may be, and again, highly speculative. We don't know any of this. Yeah. Uh, it, if if the case is that we live in a simulation, and that is the truth, and the simulation allowed for agents inside to discover that through different methods. That means that it, either they forgot to patch that and they could technically, you know, uh, or it's not a secret and it's just part of the natural understanding of how things work. And that's the thing we've been engaged for for many, many years since the scientific revolution. And maybe, you know, like not now, but maybe ultimately the cash value will be that now that we understand they believe in a computational environment. If we learn how to work with it, maybe we can bend the laws of physics. Maybe we can f- yeah. faster than life. And I, I actually share those views, um, Danny. And um, I think that the fact that we talk about this, the fact that we are uh, allowed and we are given the tools 
to think about this even. It means that if this is really happening, whoever is behind it, um, he wants us to find out about this. He wants us to learn about it. He wants us to find about it. Okay. Otherwise, we would not be able to even talk about this, and we would not have the the tools and the 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 the, the, the means to even the cognitive tools. Exactly. Exactly. So this is it's it's an encouragement. The fact that we are given the, the the, I, I don't want to call it free will, but the, the, the tools to actually look at this uh, and investigate it. I to think understand, it, yeah. To understand, yeah. I think, I think it's an encouragement, yeah. So that's my answer to you. And I, and I get, but I understand your point. Your point is that you feel that... Uh, but I just I feel that just too. having a hard time believing that somebody with the willingness to invest, that would be the impediment. Like, yeah, maybe it's my way of trying to find an excuse. Um, but, <laughs> but, but... Uh, yeah, from my personal angle is the fact that you, you, you see it, it, this does not make me happy. You know the the fact that the the world is first of all it doesn't it it brings more questions than answers. It doesn't tell us what's our role in this. It doesn't tell us um, do we have a free will. It doesn't tell us um, who is doing it. It doesn't it it just it kicks the can down the road that instead of trying to understand the world and the universe. And where we're here, and what 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 is this world we live in, and everything, it, it kind of we we have a model that we build on, and then here is a new idea. But this new idea, if it's true, okay, it doesn't it, it generates more questions than answers. Okay, I, I I in that sense I agree with you because because this discovery, if true, is different in a way from all the other discoveries because all the other physical discoveries in physics. Uh, somehow tethered to one another in a logical chain of of command somehow, but then this yeah, one but... basically throws like an arbitrary monkey wrench. It says it can be anything because no, no, I I disagree here because it's... no, I disagree here. Actually, actually, this doesn't uh, negates anything we know in science and physics up to this point. Perhaps no, I'm not, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying it negates everything we know in science. I'm saying that whatever it is, the external picture, like we, like we said. Oh, that, that changes like, completely. Yeah, yeah. it's like it's anything because simulated. So like it, it's basically kind of like a magic wand and anything can be out there. And that is to some extent I agree that it makes, like you said, more questions than answers. Like it, it doesn't follow a nice like, ah, oh, it makes sense of everything. It's like, no, now it makes sense of nothing because <laughs> now it's like... And- yeah. It doesn't give you any reward that hey, we we have this now, we understand this, now we are making progress. No, we are not making any progress. We are back to square one. We still have additional questions to answer, and we still we, it seems to be a never-ending search. <laughs> <laughs> so would be the conclusion then be just maybe just limit our research within the bounds of? No, I don't our... think I don't think we can do that. I think we are genetically programmed i think we are built to seek uh, answers all the time i think well, mankind is wa- uh, uh, wired into you know this this greed for understanding greed for you know knowing greed for finding out solving things and i think we we can't stop that i think uh, that's unstoppable what i'm trying to say is that oh sorry guys. is it 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 it, it, it the moment you answer something or you find something, a few other questions branch branch out from that, and it creates almost more headache. <laughs> but that's always the case. That was a, so. That's my question. And look, I, for I'm, example, when I'm, quantum mechanics, when quantum mechanics uh, emerged, it, it did explain a lot of observations, a lot of uh, experimental things. That uh, it, it was beautiful, but but then it brought uh, about. So much weird stuff that we we don't we don't understand really we don't understand, right? So that's my question to you. And look, I am in full awareness that you're a physicist, and what you can answer with some amount of of confidence is questions about physics. But I'm just throwing a curveball for the for the heck of it because I know that, that I would not feel satisfied that I didn't. Would it not then imply maybe that it's not? I, I don't know if it's true across the board that humans have this tendency, I think, uh, because again, the Eastern traditions came up with a different answer to the question, which is just, just be, 
and the don't worry about it. Uh, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the Buddhistic view. The Buddhist. Uh, and maybe yeah. that's what it points to, that it kind of, we reached, again, a big maybe, I'm not saying yes or no, I'm saying just playing with an idea, that maybe we reached a level, we reached a certain kind of understanding from which the vector of seeking bounces back with such force that we're like, okay, maybe we need to just live our lives and just yeah. enjoy whatever. Step back, yeah, 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 yeah. So just a thought, mm -hmm. but uh, and, and, and yeah. I think I think ultimately, I, I you know, I, I've been voicing this, I think in the last like three, four podcasts that I've done, so I might sound like a broken record to a few people, but I really think, and this is maybe my naivete, but I, I feel like there is a balance to be struck here between the the seeking that always looks to better technology and understand the world better because there is something wholesome and there is something even I would say divine about like a true understanding of a thing, a, a balance between that and the ability to just live in the moment. I don't think it has to be one or the other. I think we can find a way to strike the balance between those two, just like the left and the right hemisphere of the brain, people who are, you know, tend more towards the 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 technical, the under, like the science, and then people who tend more towards the... And then, join these forces and be a civilization that both understands the world because it likes doing that but at the same time cherishes and values the divine the sacred the moment and it infuses the science and the technology through this divinity so it creates divine technologies it creates beauty through the understanding and not just oh it's functional and it it, it, the Dyson sphere is not just doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's also an ornament. It's also beautiful. It also adds yes. something to the universe. Like yeah. that is something that I think we want to strive for if we, because I don't see a way, it seems arbitrary to say, okay, this is the upper bound of understanding everybody. Let's go home. That's weird. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, but on the other, because eventually the sun will become a red giant. So we do need technology to be able to survive that event, no matter how yeah. far it looks in the future. So, yeah. Technology definitely has a place. Also, if a meteor comes right now, the only thing it can save us is some form of technology, right? So, but also I think we shouldn't forget the human values and and just being here for each other and support each other and love each other, which is something that is, as we can see in the world right now, is pretty lacking on, a, on you know, both global scale. That's so sure. very beautifully uh, put it and um, I like it the way you um, summarized everything there. It's uh, very nice. Melvin, thank you for, uh, first of all, taking the time to do this. And thank you so much for indulging uh, also me with my uh, more poetic thought. Um, I Danny, it was my pleasure. It was my pleasure, sir. Yeah, I deeply value you as a person and uh, as an intellectual and a scientist, man. You're, you're, you're really an incredible person. So um, I'm honored to call you a friend and uh, we'll do this again at some point. Thank you for having me. God bless. God bless.